And then I am going to go live here and start webinar. Okay. And we will give it a second. We are we are now live. And sometimes it takes a few seconds. Um, Uh, here we go. Hello, welcome. Okay. Well, we can we could get um, we could get going, and then as people come in, um, we could reiterate if we have any um, anything uh, anything else. Um, okay. Uh, Welcome to Virtual Lunch with author Leah Geller. We are really excited to have you here today. Um, we just, uh, some housekeeping. Um, this is a fun, friendly event. Um, any semblance of abusive language, hate speech, racism will have you removed from the meeting, which is not why we're here. We're here to have a really fun chat with this author. Um, the uh, way that you can engage, this is in webinar mode. So there is a chat function and a Q&A function. Uh, any questions you have for Leah can be uh, brought through Q&A and chat and um, Evelyn and myself will bring it to her. So without any further ado, I'm gonna let Evelyn introduce our author. Okay, great. First I'll introduce myself. I'm Evelyn Hershkowitz. I'm a Rita Services Librarian here at the Syosset Public Library. And we are very happy and excited to have with us today, Leah Geller, who is a recipient of the 2019 Catherine Gerfine Writing Fellowship at Sarah Lawrence College. She lives in New York with her husband and five children. Five children, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Wakes up, makes five separate breakfasts. Leah began her writing career by blogging about her adventures in the trenches of parenting and got the idea for her first novel, Trophy Life, when her two sons were in middle school. When Lee is not writing and eavesdropping on her children, she can be found running, drinking diner coffee, and occasionally teaching middle school English. She's a graduate of Columbia University and Stanford Law School. Thank you so much, Leah, for joining us. We really appreciate it. It's so Thank nice to have you here. And why don't we tell everybody what we're talking about today is actually your newest book, which came out in April, called The Truth and Other Hidden Things. I am loving this book. It is, you know what? We've been reading dark and dismal and a lot of stuff that is just not uplifting at all. So it's so nice to read something like this that makes you laugh and smile and enjoy the character. And thank God I'm not pregnant and <laughs> other things yes. like that. I mean, Please that could get very dark, but yes. <laughs> Please tell our audience all about what the book is, what the book is about. It's about a woman who on the same day that she learns that she has to leave the city because her husband hasn't gotten tenure and they have to move to an upstate university. She's in her mid 40s. She has two adolescent kids and she finds out that she her IUD has failed and she's pregnant. Um, and she which she finds out by throwing up into a crock pot. So um, that's kind of her story. That's where we meet her. So everything's being upended and she has to leave her home and start over again. and start over pregnant when she didn't think she would be um, and sort of what she does when she gets to Dutchess County to this new job and the, the secret blog that she starts when she arrives. Yeah, it's just so funny. I love the characters. I love all the moms, the PTA president. I mean, they're just, it's so much fun. It really is. It was fun to write. I hope that yeah. comes through. Yeah. Do you live in New York City or outside of New York? I live in Riverdale. Um, oh, okay. So. I I'm, I'm actually on the very last street of Riverdale, which is like the last street of the city. Like I'm yeah. just at the top. Wow. Okay. Yeah. So what did you know about Dutchess County? Um, you know, you don't really need to know a lot about Dutchess County. You need to know about hipster culture, first of all, which is everywhere now, which is why I think it's kind of fun because every town in America has something that's some, you know, like kombucha is not just in Dutchess County. So, right. you know, neither is the man bun or chia pudding or all that stuff. That's everywhere. Um, we're all using mason jars. Like I just felt like that was universal and it was a migration of hipster culture from Brooklyn, you know, places where they all started and they couldn't afford to stay. So went down there, but I, I made a bunch of trips up to Dutchess. Um, it was great. Yeah. Yeah, nice I, I, I did some research trips. That's nice to do research like that. Being able to, I mean, not a far ride at all, so. Well, you know, I, 
I remember reading that the woman who wrote the Twilight books had never been to Seattle. And I was- Yes, oh, that's true. And, uh, and it's funny, I lived there for seven years. And so I can't, she really captured it without actually being there. And um, I like to be able to see where I'm going or to have, to know it. Um, but I, I mean, I, yeah, it was the, for, for the, from this perspective, like it was helpful to be able to go and visit. Absolutely. Wow, I didn't know she never went to Seattle. Oh, no. you didn't know that? That's so oh, funny. That's pretty amazing that she yeah, took really Seattle is. and never having been there. Wow. No, I had no idea. No idea. Well, your book on Goodreads, it has gotten such fabulous reviews. Like everybody oh, that makes loves. me so happy. Yeah, no. Yeah, like, like all five star reviews. reviews. <laughs> It's not my children leaving all the reviews. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. We weren't applying it. It was just kind no, of. No, I know. Like, I'm kidding. I know. But, I, but I, I think I think one of my sons tried to leave a review after, without having read the book. And I was like, listen. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But you're doing, you're doing, fi you're doing fine you're on fine. your own. So, you read your own reviews? Um, I do sometimes um, on Amazon, on Goodreads. Um, I do. I mean, it's, you know, it's funny, like. I, some people are crazy about reading them and interact with the reviewers and take it to heart. Some people have a policy where they don't read. Um, I read them. I read some of them. And I and I actually I actually consider them like I do think if a lot of people are saying the same thing about then it's interesting to me. Yeah. Um, so I do read them, but I, I would I don't go nuts. And it probably helps you for your next. Yeah, and it helps to also Project. send, yes, for sure. Because yeah. I'm, you know, we're all still growing in this stuff. Right, right. So you wrote this during the pandemic? No, I edited it during the, I didn't, no, my pandemic productivity was not. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Um, I did edit it and start work on a new project in the pandemic, but I know people who just sat down and wrote a book in the from start to end of the pandemic. And it just was not me. Yeah. No. Kind of, yeah, we've, we've interviewed authors who've done both. Yeah, but. I mean, I think partly depends on what's going on in your home life um, and um, how, how, how creative and productive you felt in this period. Like it, for me, it was so crazy. I actually started to write this book about these, this woman who was fed up and left her home and kind of ran away to this place where she found all these other fed up women. It was kind of like this funny sort of like camp hideout. And then the pandemic hit and not, and I don't want to write about it, but nothing that I could make up about what these women were going through in their homes could compare to what we were going right. through in our homes. Right. Exactly. Like it all felt silly that you could complain about whatever it was having to unload the dishwasher, like whatever it was or what your husband was doing or your, whether your kids spoke to you suddenly, like you were homeschooling and you were, you know, you were staff psychologist for the house and you were keeping your act together and, you know, trying to find toilet paper like just felt like none of that's funnier and, and then there's more material in the in reality than there was in what I was writing about so I changed gears and, and started something else but it was an interesting time to, to, to try and create something so tell us about this book then um when did you write it and um I finished it right before I mean I I think I sold it in the months before right in a couple months before the pandemic and so I was in the editing process in those first few months. Very nice. So, okay. So how did you, how did the story, I mean, we talked a little bit about hipster culture, which yes, you said is everywhere, um, which for, for like, if you like food, that's good, but you know, it's, it's a, it's definitely a thing. Um, how did you come up with your main character and how did you decide like that all of this was going to happen to her at this point? Um, I think she, I, I do feel like these people kind of find you as a writer, like <clears throat> they make their way. I'm just going to take a drink. They make their way to you. I, I don't know how I got this vision for this woman who has had some social anxiety and had to, and had to move. And, um, <clears throat> I just, I just decide, and I actually know women who in there, you know, we, we do read a lot about accidental pregnancies, but you don't read them, um, so much about women who already have children and are a little older and think that they're done. And so I, and I know that happens everywhere. I mean, it certainly have people that I know. And so I thought, well, th there could be humor in there and there could be introspection in terms of preparing one child to leave, you know, cause she has a, <clears throat> like a 17 year old and, um, and having a baby. And so I kind of imagined that. And then 
it just seemed obvious to me that she would go to Duchess and she would sort of like um, confront all this hipster culture. I think it all just kind of came to me at the same time. And I read that you started, you actually were blogging before you wrote the book, which really gave you the incentive to write the book. And in this book, the main character is a blogger. Right. And so um, I, yeah. So, I mean, I was not anonymous, um, but yes, I sort of knew that world. I knew how it works. I know how you can, how you rate yourself as a blogger, how you wait for other people to read and share your blog and how she kind of like, you know, we tell our kids all the time, Instagram's not real. The internet's not real. People put their best pictures out, you know, and you shouldn't judge yourself by how many likes you get. And then she falls right into that trap. Yeah. Herself. Yeah. I think that, that that's so, um, that's so relevant because I think we all do that. Yeah. Like, are we like, you know, are we like really good, good examples to the people that we're trying to tell that to when we, when we fall into that? Um, so, yeah. How long yeah, have you been blogging? What did you say? How long have you been blogging? Um, I was, um, I was started to blog, I think in 2007, I was living in Seattle. Um, I was lawyering still from, I was working from home when I was working part-time. I was not that happy in A, in Seattle, B, as a lawyer. And I just, and, and I had, I think I had, I had three or four kids at the time and it was just insane. And so I just, I would like tell these stories to my friends about things that were happening to me and they would do, that's hysterical. You should write that down. So, I mean, people, it wasn't early blog. It was kind of, you know, in the middle still of it, but I just started to, you know, write these things up and put them out there. And it is great training, you know, as a writer, A, you'd learn how to be concise and sort of write this small nugget of a story that kind of like comes full circle. And then you learn how to put your work out there and wait and see what happens and see how people feel. So it wasn't that stressful to actually, you know, pass a manuscript around and wait for comments because I'd been doing it for so many years. Did you always want to be a writer? Yeah, I did. I mean, I'm definitely one of those girls that went to law school because writing wasn't a career. I mean, there were many of us, especially when I was coming out of college. Mm -hmm. um, there was like a heavy emphasis on pre-professionalism when I was coming out. And, and I don't see it so much now and it's terrific. Like, right. you know, I actually, one of the interesting things is, you know, I do sort of knock the millennials in this book and I kind of make fun of them, but I'm actually so impressed. There's so much that they get right about work-life balance, about not running, not running to graduate school for a degree you don't want because someone told you to. Like they're not making this many of the same mistakes that we made. Um, it's interesting, they're an interesting group. Yeah, I find that there are so many lawyers or former lawyers who are authors now. Because I, mean, I think so many of us, A, wanted to do this anyway. Yeah, not just women. That's men very, yeah, that's yeah. very interesting that we, we, um, we've we noticed that as well. Yeah. I think many of them, if you, and to be honest, you know, you could only sort of write when you have a story to tell and maybe the time it needed to be what it needed to be. But it was sort of like at this time where you had to choose a profession. And, and, and if you, you know, if you, if you were math or science, you went one way. Right. And if you were sort of English history, creativity, you went another way, but that, usually, that way was usually into law school for lots of people. Yeah. Well, you certainly went to one of the top. So, right. Yeah. And it was a great experience and I've, I met terrific people and I'm sure I'm using it in some way. Um, right. I just don't know how. Right. Somebody wants to know, uh, do you identify with bells and is pig kill based on a real place? Um, pig kill's not really. I mean, this fish kill up in, right. and I yeah. sort of, you know, I wanted like the I, pig to me, pig just sounds funny. Like pig kill, like, you know, as a, as, as a humorous writer, like I'm always looking for those like awkward, funny words to represent things. It's not really based. I mean, I spent a lot of time in like Beacon and the areas around there and Hudson and, um, and in fish kill. So I think it's sort of an amalgamation of all those places. Um, I do identify with her. I mean, I certainly feel like as an introvert, I can identify with that feeling that having to sort of go to lots of parties and talk to people, especially for her husband's job that, and she's pretending to be, and she's, she just, and she feels so terrible that she's not better at it. Like I do, I can identify with that. Um, I can identify with her as a parent for sure. You know, um, so many books have been written about, you know, slacker moms. 
And, yeah. and, and she's not a slacker mom. Like she has actually consciously opted out of what she considers to be an unrealistic and dangerous rat race for her kids. Like, I don't think she's lazy. You know, she's not, she's not one of those wine o'clock moms. She's she cares. I just think she feels like this is who they are and to pretend otherwise would be bad for them. And she came from that world and it hasn't served her that well. So why not just be happier? Um, and I, I do that. I do very much identify with that. I think, I think sort of raising kids in this incredible pre-college world that we are now. I mean, we do all these things for them. You know, we pretend that we want them to be well-rounded just for their own sake, but it's not really for them. First of all, I don't know what a well-rounded 18 year old looks like. And um, it's really all for college. I mean, we pretend it's for other things, but it's for college. And I think she, she sees it and she's not impressed. I love the mothers and the mother and the mother-in-law. Oh, they were my favorite Great characters. They were my <laughs> absolute favorites to write about. Every yeah. scene, every scene, the scene in the closet, the scene at the end, every scene with them. Yeah. It's my favorite to write. Yeah, they're great characters. Her mother is a piece of work, but so is her mother-in-law. I mean, I mean they both... <laughs> right. They're sort of counter, they're sort of opposites in there. And in, right. in, 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 you know, they're both sort of are dissatisfied with her, or at least she thinks they are for different reasons. Um, right. Her mother's a piece of, her, well, her mother's a different generation. She doesn't understand why, why she, you know, had to work so hard and her daughter just wants to stay home and bake. Like she doesn't get it. Like that's not impressive to her. Especially she has a law degree also. Right. She has it also. And she had to probably, she went back, you know, as a single mother and this, and she already had it. And why is she went throwing it away? And you know how hard it is for us. And there is that generation of women that looks at are my generation and wants to know why we're all baking sourdough bread. Like what, like for what? Like who are you, you know, they, they don't understand that. Are you a baker? Then, no, I'm <laughs> terrible. I'm are you, terrible. are you, an, are you a consumer of sourdough bread though? Um, Not so much, I, not your yes. favorite? Is it, I'm not, I actually, I um, I prefer like, well, I am a consumer of sourdough bread, but I prefer my desserts to be sort of like of the sticky pudding, like sticky, variety like right 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 yeah treacly, sticky like uh, baked goods in general don't do that much for me but just give me like a bar of chocolate and some caramel and I'm fine like that's kind of how I squeams um I'm a terrible baker I am I'm actively bad for all the reasons that she's very good um and the funny thing is my ovens have been bust for a month <laughs> and um I don't know if you got to the part in the book where she has to get her ovens repaired right. all my friends are joking about how no one's coming here to repair it <laughs> right so, um, yeah. And the kitchen is not even in the house. I know. Have you I seen know. a house like that? Does that really exist? No, you know, when we lived in, um, we lived in LA before I lived in Seattle, we had oh, a garage, wow. a tiny little house and I changed the garage into an office that I could work. And I used to have to walk through the yard every day, but it was LA and there was a lemon tree and it was great. Yeah. And I often thought, wouldn't it be funny if I had to do this in the rain? Um, and, you know, and I was thinking about, I very much was thinking about the house as a character in the book and how, you know, for her and for, basically for all of us, but really for her, the kitchen is the heart of the house. Um, how would it feel if it were like outside of your body? You know, she's feel, basically the house, the, you know, in, in this, in this case, the heart is very much outside of the body. And that's, that's a sign of her displacement. You know, she's just never going to feel comfortable here. Somebody wants to know, do you think mom culture online can be used for good? Um, and I, I guess um, they're talking just about because uh, mom blogging and just blogging in general. Um, I mean, I know I've seen a bunch of blogs and there there is a lot of there, there's like there, it seems like there's two camps. There's either like the hot mess mom blog and then there's the judgy sanctimony blog. Right um what are your feelings yeah what are your feelings about that um well first of all I think anything can be used for good online I mean you just look at this past year like any 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 and you know any of these women could decide to take up a social justice movement or write about something that's happening to them or create community for people who are isolated at home and you can use anything for good right um I do think you know we do I, I I can't imagine there's ever been a time when so many women were writing books right now and writing blogs right now. And so there is something terrific about this, like all these voices. It would be great if you could find somewhere between, you know, a hot mess and sanctimonies. Um, and I think that we're seeing it. I think that sort of it, it is starting to even out and those things are kind of becoming caricatures anyway. But I'm all, I mean, I just think it, and it also, 
I mean, raising children is very isolating in very many ways. And I think it was certainly for me, you know, I was in Seattle, it was raining, I was working from home, I had babies and I, I don't, I was very isolated and I, it was a way for me to sort of leave my house and meet people and talk to people. And so I think that for many women of the past 20 years who found themselves at home or whether full-time, part-time or not at all, you know, or even just in the evenings, just working and then coming home, um, it was a great way to sort of like talk about your experience and have other women talk about theirs. So I'm pretty positive on it. I mean, obviously like those ones that make us all feel like the worst parent in the world are, I don't know what, what, what function they serve, but um, people like those too. Yeah, I, it's funny because you were talking before about being an introvert and, you know, having to like have like bells, like, you know, talk to people at functions. And I was just reading, um, speaking about mommy bloggers, Jenny Lawson's Broken in the Best Possible Way. And she just has this list of of awkward conversations she started that she shows her husband before he tells her she has to come socialize <laughs> with <laughs> with him and then he's like I don't know if I need you yeah exactly yeah exactly uh I I think like it, you know and she she's one of those people I think like she's uh, I guess one I don't know if I would necessarily consider her a hot mess mom she really like she's, she's, she's a- like yeah, yeah. I feel like she, well, she she addresses mental illness as well. Yes, I mean, yes. Call her a hot mess would be unfair. I mean, I think it would be not, totally unfair. Yeah, I mean, considering she seems to have done quite well and got and and and, and reached out to many people. So yeah, yeah. You know, I think like uh, I guess when you're talking about that middle ground, she would kind of be she a good be person there, because yeah. she's very like she shows the ugly, but she's also she's very funny about it. Yeah, and um, I think her approach to mental health and her relationship with her husband is like very very endearing because man Victor's been through a lot too 100% and he's still there and he's still there uh somebody wants to know did you have to research IUD failure rates <laughs> so I happen to know like a handful of women to whom this has happened well, so, so I just assumed if I know you know in my little corner of the world um and so I did consult um my, a good friend who is an, uh, an, uh, an obstetrician. So, and, and she's and, and kind of got some info from her. And then sort of the scene where she finds out that she's pregnant and with the IUD is sort of how they, like the IUD removal scene. Like I, that I really had to, you know, f- find out exactly what that looks like. Um, but it does strike fear because it's not uncommon. Yeah, no, it's not, but it's scary. <laughs> And that age to have a baby after you've had two teenagers. How old not, are your children? Um, I don't, you know, um, there was a period of time, you know, I have five and they're, they're all relatively close. There was a period of time where every time I would be like, guys, I have news for you. They would think that that's what I was going to tell them. Right. Um, the baby, I think would not be, she's like, I think she would not, she would not take to it. So, well. I mean, I think now that they're teenagers, it would be really awkward. And, right. you know, I, um, also many, like many women of my generation, my parents divorced and remarried and then had young children when I was a pre, like 14 years old. And so I do remember like my mother breastfeeding and like at the mall and it just seemed like, I couldn't think of anything worse. And it just was, and, and the maternity clothes they, and they were not like they are now. They had yeah. this nasty stretchy material over your stomach. And I just, I was horrified. And so I actually don't have that much of that. I mean, a little bit of that. We have, but the idea, you know, when 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 she realizes that she tells all of her friends, you know, um, that, that her mom is about to have a baby, then she realizes she just told all of her friends that her parents have sex. Right. <laughs> so, like there is some of that piece that's like, and that that happens in in, in many families. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. I that, just yeah. can't really imagine. <laughs> yeah. Be- no, I'm just I'm thinking <laughs> about it because I was I was an only child for almost ten years, and um, I really wanted a sibling, and eventually I got a sibling. But you, when you when you learn that piece to it, you know, like, like as oh, child, that's how that child got here. You're like, oh, man, I don't know if I really, you know, it's like it's it's easier if you knew if you find that out after your siblings. <laughs> Right. Years later. Yeah. yeah. Um, so once again, if anybody has any questions to drop in the Q&A in the chat, please do. But Evelyn, did you want to talk a little bit about um, some of your favorite parts? Oh, yeah. No, I just I just I'm so happy to find a book 
that made me laugh and made me happy because like I said, it was just uh, horrible, the depressing books that I've been reading. <laughs> well, there, there is a lot of that dark page yeah. turning mystery. I mean, not that not that they're not enjoyable. They are. Right. I mean, they're great books written well, and I love them. But when you pick up a book and the woman is just funny and, and I, the characters are just so great. And, you know, the handyman that comes over and isn't really doing much or I mean, her oven is broken. She can't even get up in the middle of the night and bake. That was her anxiety that took away her anxiety while her baking. I just loved it. It's just so great. It's just so nice. And what are you working on now? Um, I am working on a um, story about a woman who actually lives in Seattle um, and she was a child actress in like the late 80s, very early 90s, and then left the business. But they're, they're doing a reboot of the show. So oh, she has to travel okay. back to L.A. and kind of back in time and sort of that's shoot good. that. Yeah, and she's been a lot out. of reboots now. So that's, that's I know I was thinking of that. And um, yeah. And also just sort of that time period is that we're all re-examining it now. Right. Um, yes, we are. Yeah. It's time. Yeah. Did, where, did you have any specific, I mean, did you, you don't have to say the name, but did you have any specific um, actors in mind when you were coming up with the idea? Oh, for that? Um, no. Um, when I first came up with the idea, I didn't. I just started to write. And then as I've been writing, I've been reading lots of memoirs because there's millions of them now. Um, and the ones that are most interesting to me are the ones of the people that left the business and came back. Like the people who stayed in it the whole time, their, their faces are upkept, right? Like it's the, it's the person who's been living like a regular life somewhere and then suddenly has to go back to LA and look around when they don't look anything like her. And they are all well practiced at the art of sort of coming in and out of the screen, you know, that world. And she just feels like a fish out of water. So, um, but they, I have read many very good celebrity memoirs while doing research for this book. Uh, somebody wants to know how was um, this book, I guess, um, um, Truth and Other Hidden Things different to write than The Trophy Life? Um, it was different to write. Um, what was my, it wasn't my first and that makes a very big difference because it wasn't the first time I had to do it. So I knew more about what I was doing. Um, Trophy Life, the woman was in her, was younger than me um, and very different. Um, I mean, she was with middle schoolers. And so that was kind of my sons were in middle school at the time. I said, that was what, that was the familiar territory, but her, she and her life were very, were very foreign to me. You know, Bells has led a somewhat similar life to me. So I, even though she's quite different, I felt like I could pour a little bit more of myself into this book. Like you, you know, if you knew me, you would hear me on those pages somewhat, not entirely, but I felt like this, this, you know, this is more familiar. Are there, um, what do you usually like to read um, yourself? Um, I love all fiction, really. I mean, just, um, I have, I, and I, and I do love women's fiction and stories about women. Like I just, um, I could read those exclusively. Um, I also liked, I do read some of those thrillers, um, not entirely, um, but I, they're, you know, they're sort of everywhere right now. So um, I do, I generally prefer, I wouldn't say, I, I love a good funny read for sure. Um, it's so hard to find though. So they're hard us, to find. Yeah, tell give us, us some about. recommendations. Yeah, tell us some good funny reads since um, you're a funny okay. writer. I read Nora Ephron's Heartburn every year. Oh, okay. Oh. So if you've read it, reread it. Um, without a doubt, um, I think that that is like stands atop the field. Um, yeah. I also really like um, that the writer Shirley Jackson, who does not write funny books, but she has oh. these funny. She she wrote these two books about living in Vermont with her four children and her professor husband. Um, and they're very, they were like mommy blogs before mommy blogs. They're called um, Life Among the Savages. And I can't remember the name of the second one. They are hysterical. They are very, very good. The author of the lottery. Yeah. Well, no, for sure. Like she has that whole dark side. But <laughs> and, really and we've always lived in the castle, right? <laughs> yes. 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 And, and, uh, yeah, all of that. But she has very funny books. Okay, um, and they are great. I highly recommend those. Okay. That's really good to know. Where are you from? I detect an accent. Originally, I'm from England. Oh, okay. But oh, I've been okay. here for a really long time. Okay. 
I do detect a little bit of the accent coming through now and then, but. And I also do read a lot of like memoir biography type books. And I've just read the Mike Nichols one, which was excellent. I highly recommend that. Have you read the Rob Lowe ones? Yes. Aren't they fun? They're great. Yeah, those they're are really fun. great. Um, I read, I'll tell you, Jessica Simpson's was excellent. And I, everybody I, loves that one. That I was mean, such I a surprise. I can't say I was ever much of a fan. I listened to it, which is a new thing for me. And she has a lovely voice, a lovely speaking voice. Mm -hmm. um, I highly recommend. It's very good. Um, uh, what I, I read Demi Moore and Sharon Stones, which was quite interesting. Yeah, that she had stroke. Yeah. Um, I think I'm getting Andrew McCarthy's as soon as it comes out. I've really, I really, Corey Feldman, I went for a deep dive in here. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. Was, that, was, was that research though? It was, it was, it was research about like what it, just, even just for some of like the, what's it like to be in classroom on a set and, and that kind of little things like that. Yeah. yeah you should read some of the, did the, any of the Brady Bunch kids write books? Somebody did. Yeah. One of them did. Greg did. Yeah read about what went on with them that, that right was, right this is interesting and also as someone who grew up with all of that culture that's interesting as right. well because it's very reflective of the time at what age did you come here uh i think i was about 10. oh you were young yeah i was young you were young okay good very good very good now uh somebody wants to know are you okay yeah i had a thought and i, lo I lost it oh welcome to my world this is i'm mine uh, everybody's world. Uh, we, we do have an audience question. Um, do you base the kids in your story on your own kids? Um, no, not entirely. Um, I did have a son around the same, I have, a, I have sons around, you know, my, they're old, they're now 19 and 17, but they were one, the, he was a junior at the time. So I definitely was sort of like in the world of talking about what you talk to juniors about. He's not really based on my son, but, um, but my experience parenting boys in school has largely informed my writing, I would say. Um, it certainly informed my first book and I feel very, it, it's definitely been interesting for me to, um, you know, growing up a girl and like a good student and an easy student and seeing boys in school today, even the good ones, like seeing, watch, it's very new for me, um, watching how hard it is sometimes for boys to navigate school, even the great students, just sort of like the sitting, the, this, the, the, the you know, that kind of thing. Um, so I think yes, but not, the characters aren't exactly the same. Yeah, I would imagine that would be difficult. I'm a mom of boys as well. So, um, yes. Yeah. Uh, Did you blog that you have chickens? Yes. In Riverdale? In Riverdale. Actually, it's very interesting. Yeah. So that was my big pandemic. I became a chicken farmer. Wow. Um, I, I, you think you're going to get a handful. And now I have 13 and four what? of them are still young and living in the house. No way. Yeah in a tub in the, in the downstairs. Yeah. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I, I, um, the boys were eating a lot of eggs. We couldn't find eggs here in Riverdale during the pandemic. And, um, you know what? No, that's a thing. There's a lot of people who have adopted, who have become chicken owners um, because of that. A hundred percent. And I couldn't find eggs. And so I was like, let's get chickens. And then no one told me that I was gonna have to wait six months for those birds to lay an egg. So in the meantime, I could build a home for them. I had to feed them. I had to shovel. Um, they're great now, though. We get lots of eggs, and they're fun. And so I, then I decided, well, it's the spring. Maybe I should add to the flock and get some eggs that lay blue hens. But they have to live inside in, like, a box with, like, a heat lamp until they're old enough. And then there's this whole process where I have to introduce them to the old hens so they don't get pecked to death. Oh, my gosh. The yeah, I just... Yeah, it's not busy thing. enough with five children. You need apparently not. Apparently not. <laughs> I feel like this is fodder <laughs> for a book, though. Right. 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 So that yeah. So I am that. That is in the back of my mind. Yeah. That your that your chickens your chickens will be characters. In I think in so. Books. I think someone has to have chickens. Are you the sole caretaker of these chickens? Um, I'm mostly. The kids can collect eggs and. One of them is very good at like, if we need to move them, she's very good at wrangling them. My husband though built this coop. I sort of was, I assisted. Um, so now, now that he's more involved in the construction, it's the two of us, but yes. I mean, you could really go down. I mean, talk about like go down the internet hole. <laughs> this, so yeah. like, but, but in a way, I'm just, I'm just thinking of like, you know, like the hipster world you wrote about, like. I'm in it. You, yeah, you're in it. That's, I'm in it. Yeah, I mean, that's the it. thing. There have been a lot of good, 
things from that hipster world that I wrote about, right? Like there are good, it's, I mean, it went, it, it, it's, you can go nuts, but like chickens that lay eggs aren't such a bad thing. Like yeah. having a, you know, like, but yes, I'm very much in that now. I'm definitely a victim of it. Wow. And your love for diner coffee. I think Jessica can relate to the love. For I coffee. drink so much coffee. It's not even funny. And but I love like a cup it. of black diner institutional coffee. <laughs> yeah, I haven't had that in a while. It's been a cross between what I make at my own house and coffee well, like, pods. Right, bodega coffee, coffee pot coffee. I love it all. Oh yeah, definitely. Um, hang on a second. I just thought I saw something pop up. Um, oh, was somebody wants to know if you were ever an anonymous blogger? No. I mean, no. Yeah. I might have mailed made veiled references to people I didn't like, but no. <laughs> Yeah, that could be, well, I mean, I, so how did you decide to sort of wade into that in the book? I guess I'm going to kind of piggyback off of that because that really gets bells into trouble. Um, well, there have been these, there were like a spate of women who blogged under another name and then had this grand reveal of themselves. Um, I don't know. There was something about being able, especially for her, being able to say all the things you wanted to say and have the cover of anonymity to say them and how liberating, but how dangerous that would be. Like, what would you do if you could have somewhere where you could write everything you thought and nobody would know it was you? I'd be petrified. <laughs> yeah, but it would, right, as you should be, but she's not petrified. I think right. she, she loves it. Yeah, no, I would, I, if I wrote everything I thought, I would be in big trouble. Big trouble. <laughs> it's a scary thing to do. It really is. Scary thing to do. Yeah, but, it, but, but it's, it's not a brave thing. And I don't think she's very brave when we meet her. Right. Yeah, no, it's unbelievable. But living, uh, you know, she also has to make sure that her husband doesn't find out. I mean, that would be like right marriage suicide practically. Right. I mean, he his career is the center of their lives, right? And she puts it at risk. Maybe, and un, maybe not unintentionally. And maybe there's a piece of her that is tired of having his career be the center of their lives. Yeah. Do universities really give their professors homes? I didn't know that. Yes. Oh, okay. I mean, maybe not quite. Like, yes, in some way, yes. I, I never knew that. Not all and not like this, but I did. I also researched that as well. Okay. Yeah. Because the, the other woman has some home. Yes. I mean, they, yes. they did not get the prize home. That's for No, sure. they did not. No, they did not. But her, her friend, if you want to call her a friend. Right. Cynthia gets a very nice a house. Very really nice house. Right. With a kitchen in the house. Yeah. Yeah, that kitchen outside still still getting to me. Unless you're living in LA, like you say, and it's like you have a barbecue set up and a whole outdoor I, area. But, yeah, that almost seems like a luxury. Like uh, you know, when you, like people who set a kit, yeah, for like you know their outdoor living. Right. So she has that. She just doesn't have an indoor one. Right. Exactly. Yeah. No, that would that would be really awkward for me. I don't think I would enjoy that at all. Having to go, having to put your coat on. Even when I went to college, my dining hall was under the, the dorm. I never even had to go outside. Yeah, that's luxurious. <laughs> yeah, that was the best. That was really nice. I was very happy about that. And I was under the impression that all schools were like that. I did not know that that you, some of them, you had to put your coat on and walk a distance to go yes, to your you did. Yes, you did. So I just thought it was all always like that which was great it was a great great thing to do did you grow up in new york in the new york area i did for a few years and then i went to high school in florida oh wow you have I did grow up. i've been in a lot of places yeah but i'm i'm i'm, I'm I've, I've landed i think I'm, I'm done moving around you're happy here in new york. i am yeah so was trophy life based in new york also i trophy life is set in riverdale and oh, um wow. it's set it's such an interesting town and place to live and corner of the Bronx. I think more novels should be set here. It actually is very unique. Mm -hmm. um, but I said it, it's about this woman who goes to teach in a middle school. And I said it, and the middle school is housed in what used to be um, the convent, but they, they've moved in. So it's sort of like got a lot of that, like it's got a convent feel to it also. Um, and so I, 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 and I live right near Mount St. Vincent. So I would take lots of walks to like, um, feel those grounds with all the statues and sort of, you know, there was a little bit of creepiness to it. So I was, I was able to go there and, and, and scope it out. And it also says in your bio that you teach 
occasionally teach middle school English. Well, I teach part time. I teach a couple times a week. Oh, that's English great. and creative writing. Yeah. You do it from home, or are you? In no, no, no. I I go in now. Um, I did it from home when we were all from home, but right. I've been in person for a little while. Okay, and you're enjoying teaching very much. I love middle school. It's a great age. It's a great age. There's so much. I mean, I guess you could say any age of with, with a child is like a, a time of a lot of change. But middle school is a very interesting time. It was, and, and it was interesting. Someone said to me, well, you wrote about middle school and now you're writing about middle age. And I was like, well, they're not that dissimilar. Like you're sort of in between phases and awkward and not entirely satisfied. And so there's a lot there. Have your students uh, read your book? Um, my students certainly read the first one. Um, yes. Um, and that was fun. And it was funny because I finished it before I started to teach and I was, I was right about everything. Like I got into the classroom and I was like, wow, I wasn't, I didn't know, I, I made this stuff up and it was just, this does happen. Um, but they have, I don't know, they're working their way through this one. Very good. Very good. Are you in a, in a public school or private? No, school? I'm in a private school. Oh, okay. okay. Um, do you, so um, question, do you write at home or is it hard with all of those kids? Um, it is hard. Even when they're not home, it's hard because they, they, there's things that were related to them that I need to do at home. So that was part of the struggle for me. Like I often would at least twice, three times a week, I would sit in a coffee shop or a library and write um, and not having any house stuff to distract me was good. And I'm, it's not that I'm not disciplined. I just, for some reason, I didn't think I realized how much I needed sort of like that outside stimulation piece in order to write. So I'm starting to do it again, you know, I'm hitting the road now, but yes, it's hard to, it is, it is hard for me. Um, and certainly in those months when they were home all the time and, I, and they would knock on the door all the time, all the time. Someone, I need a snack. I spilled the snack. She took my snack, that kind of thing, like all day. And when oh, you write, yeah. are you a planner or are you a mm, no. by the seat of your pants? Yeah, I do. I, I fly by the seat of my pants and I stop and I plan a bit, but I mostly let it take me where, I mean, I kind of know how it's going to end. And, but I, I, every time I've ever outlined, I've never used the outline. No. Yeah, it's interesting how, you know, we didn't even know that there was this difference between right. writing yeah. styles until we started talking to a lot more writers and um one of the writers was like oh I'm a total pantser and we were like you're a what <laughs> we learned a lot during this yeah. yeah and and there are some people that outline the entire thing right well we spoke to someone last night to Jillian Cantor she wrote Half-Life and her book she had to because she had two different storylines going at the right. same time so right. she had a very carefully planned. So I think that those books, yeah. the ones that are, especially when one is in one era and the second is in another era, you definitely have to have. Right. Yeah. You have to plan. You I have to. When you're writing more of like women's fiction, like you have and humorous type books, it's all fiction and you could just run. I, I think sometimes the, the, the outline for me detracts from some of the oh, spontaneity okay. that you find your best material. Right. Yeah. Have you always been considered funny? Have your friends always said to you, oh I my God. So. So I think so. Yeah. Think so. Yeah. I mean, maybe not always funny as I think I am, but yes. <laughs> you definitely. It's fun. It's wonderful to be able to laugh and read a book. It really Especially is. Now. Your book yeah. is also out on audio. Yes. The woman who did it is terrific. Andy Arndt. She's actually, I got to like, they sent me a sample of her and She's fabulous and she's pretty well known in the audio community. Yeah, and I she, looked it up. She did a lot of audiobooks. She's the really and so steamy, steamy she, she does I, I know she does very racy stuff, which yeah. is not. And I was very I was like, is that do you want to just giggle the whole time? She's like, no, I'm a professional. But I did, <laughs> I did um, we did an Instagram live together right when the book came out. She said, let's go on Instagram live and talk about it. And so I learned so much about that life and that work. And she's great and she's very generous. Well, maybe we'll have to look her up, see if she's yeah. talking yes. to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, yeah. Love talking to audiobook narrators. I'm she's a really great. And she has like a booth in her house. Right. That, yes. And, and she showed it to me and she's very, I said, she's very generous about the process and she's a lot of fun. You should definitely talk to her. Yeah, no, we've spoken to others and it's amazing. I mean, what they've said during the pandemic, their lives haven't changed at all. No. no. They are solo acts. They do it all by themselves. They sit in their booths at home. Yeah, they just record the books and it's 100%. Yeah, it's amazing. But yeah, I haven't listened to that audio. 
I usually, I try to do both read and listen. So I get a feel for both, but with your book, I'm just reading it. It's in my head, what the voices are and just loving it all. It's a really yeah. Good job. yeah. Evelyn is, is our, definitely our resident audiobook consumer. Yeah, um, I, I enjoy them very much. When, I have uh, like a five minute commute, but I still listen to an audio book. Um, do you, uh, do you write like with a group? at all like do you I, bounce ideas off of people um i you i started out writing with a group now i just write with another person i know who who was my teacher actually at sarah lawrence we meet up once or twice a week and um even over facetime and we just go i'm like well, what do you think about this how would this work for you and she's like well actually and then often we exchange pages and give each other notes so yes i do work with someone but i think that's huge for me that's it also true. gives me deadlines so well, i expect 100 pages from you by monday and i was like fine and does she write on her own? What does she write? She writes, um, she's currently writing middle grade fiction. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. middle grade. Fi I was, I was a children's librarian for 15 years and middle grade fiction is so great these days, I think. Um, actually, we just spoke to a few weeks ago, Ali Benjamin, who wrote um, a adult book, but she was known for middle grade YA fiction. Uh, uh, there, there's just, there's such a, wealth of it that I don't think I mean and there were there were books when I was a kid just not a ton you know like there was there was Judy Bloom and there was Beverly Cleary but and Paula Danziger yes 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 and Paula Danziger but not like like Brown. now I oh. mean there's you know the diversity in the authors and the subjects that they talk about I mean I would not have had to steal my mother's Judith Krantz and Danielle Steele books off the <laughs> shelf I might have been a lot better a lot yes. yeah a lot healthier had I had I had more because we read all of that and then we're like what next Sydney Sheldon <laughs> I read those oh yes I I mean I remember this is like something I bring up a lot I remember my sixth grade reading list you know going into sixth grade I got this list and it was like the old man in the sea Danielle Steele's was like there was this Danielle Steele book I can't remember what it was called but like something about a woman who like lost her face and then got a new face. Oh, yeah, it was her first book. Was it? The Promise, I think. The Promise, The <laughs> Promise, yes. And then Flowers in the Attic. <gasps> okay, that I reread that, by the way, at the beginning of the pandemic. I reread the entire series. Oh, Did wow. you? She, she could write, V.C. Andrews. Oh, yes, I mean, she could. She has you rooting for that brother and sister to hook up. She's so good. Right, she does she convinces you that it's the best thing for them? I, I mean, she's she's really like she really took the the first one the best, yeah. But, yeah. At the time, modern gothic fiction was her like it was her field. All her, um, and I guess between Daniel Steele's The Secret and The Old Man in the Sea, like there's a I mean, reason. Hemingway, that yeah. Santiago, whatever his name was, he did not stand a chance in there. Yeah, no, not at all. Um, yeah, just, you know, thinking about what a middle schooler was going to gravitate to. And then, you know, my, my mom was like, yeah, no, we're not doing, um, we're not doing Flowers in the Attic, but. Um, oh, I read, but I read Danielle, But here's Danielle Steele. But then like one of my friends like showed me like, you know, the pages, she's like, check this out. And this is her brother. And I'm like, I don't even know what half of these things mean. And she's like, it's let not, me tell you. That, <laughs> it's not only her brother, but like she literally has crafted it so that you want it to happen. It's yes, just yes, yeah. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's pretty great. Would you ever, would you ever consider writing middle grade? Oh, for sure. I would. I mean, I, yes, especially because I really feel like I connect with that age group. I think I would. Yes. Yeah. Um, I just how, have an idea. Yeah. How would, did you think um, that your process would be very different? No, I think it's no, definitely not. Um, you know, they're shorter and lighter and they're different. It's a different kind of story, but no, I think, you know, a novel is a novel. Um, so I think the process would probably be the same. Very cool. Um, Evelyn, do you have any other questions or uh, comments? Really, I think I'm tapped out right now. I think we've spoken about every topic. Everything. everything. <laughs> Are you well, reading anything right now? Um, I just read Laura Dave's The Last Thing He Ever oh, Told Me, which just came out. my list. I like her yeah. writing. Very yeah, good. she's very good. Um, reviews. And I'm reading, I'm listening to, I'll tell you, it's on my phone. I'm listening to um, 
it's also actually a celebrity memoir, but I'm not doing it for research. I just, this woman's voice is so great. Um, it's called The Wreckage of My, The Wreckage of My Presence by Casey Wilson. I saw it's her very on good. The talk shows this week. She's, she's really great. Um, she basically was fired by Saturday Night Live for being too fat. That was like, that's her. And it's like, that, that's all, I mean, she's so much more than that, but that's how I remembered her. And her story is, she's just so much, she's just so funny. She's a writer naturally. So it's great. Um, I highly recommend it. It's really fun and definitely good to listen to. Yeah. When I saw her on the talk show, I'm like, I'm really not sure who she is. So I looked her up. I wasn't either. I'm like, oh yeah, I remember her. I remember she was there and then she wasn't. How much SNL am I even watching? But then she's just done all this other stuff and she has such a great storytelling style. And that's the audio book. Yeah. Okay. I will look into that. I'm always yes. looking for the, the yes. greatest audio books out there. So thank you. For so that. check out the Jessica Simpson also. Okay. Yeah. We've had, we have a librarian here who raved about that one. Yeah. Okay. You know, it's, you know, whose memoir is actually also very funny. I don't know if you've read um, Alison Arngrim, who was Nellie Olson on Little House on the Prairie. Oh, I'm writing that down. Yeah. She writes, she's like, it's very funny. And she also writes about like some really like sad upsetting things that happened to her as a child um which like are not even the ones that you think they're going to be because she's a child star but uh it's like she's she was very funny she writes a lot about how much hate there is for that character and like oh we hated her oh yeah totally you know but just like it's just it's such a it's such a good story and also how she and um melissa gilbert were like actually really good friends yeah uh, yeah um so that one is one that i would recommend to you okay i wrote it down all right well um if there's no other questions i want to thank um i want to thank yeah. lake union for uh bringing you here and yeah. um the book is out now right yes it's out um in audio it's out in your library it's out yes on- i have a picture of it right here cool fun Oh, you do too. Excellent. <laughs> I don't think the public can see that, just you. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, and we are uh, going to let everybody enjoy the rest of their lunch hour. Thank you so, so much for having me. Thank you. Have enjoy a wonderful day, time. everyone. Bye. Keep writing funny stuff. We need Thank you. Please. Thank you. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Leah. Thank you.